Hi, I'm Stephen Hand from Archery Supplies and today we're going to look at this gold medal world championship bow. This bow won the gold medal in 1996 in the world junior championship. Um, the year on this bow is a 1994. So how do I know it's actually 1995? So back in 1995 when you entered a tournament they used to stick a little fancy little sticker on the bow um, to show it's been through equipment um, inspection and he's written in a gold gold pen what year that was so back in the day you got all these little stickers and you used to stick them on your bow um, these days people basically just sign it off um, but back in the day you got a little sticker stuck on your bow now what is this bow this is a PSE LD 300 um, back in the time back in 1994 this was the top of the line PSE bow and so I want to show you, and I'm basically what I want to look at is what's different with bows today versus back then. So you'll notice the angle of the limbs not parallel. Today the limbs are very much parallel unless you're talking a last year's top of the line Hoyt bow. Um, in obviously in 19, in, in 1990, in the year 2020, Hoyt have now gone to parallel limbs. But in 19, 1990, in 2019, Hoyt was still using very much limbs like this in their bows. Um, but most limbs have gone parallel um, to reduce the vibration moving forward. In fact, PSE have gone back to a limbs not like this, but more point forward facing in the Supra Focus to create more um, movement forward. But you can see these limbs were very much point forward. Now, the, the limbs, um, in today's limbs, they drill through the limbs here for the pivots. You can see this is a bracket which actually goes on the limb. Now, you'll see the cam is very much a round wheel. And what's interesting here on the cams, you've got all these little things here. Now, all these little holes here is to adjust the size of the, the, size of the string. And what's particularly interesting on this bow here, this position here is the shortest position for the string. So it basically reduces the size of the string. So moving this position here down here increases the string. But what you notice here is the string's almost touching on the string here. So what that indicates to me is this string's actually stretched because there should be a gap between that point there and that point there in the string. So this string's actually stretched. So it's on the shortest position here on the cables. On the back here, you've also got adjustment. Now the cables themselves are a cable as far as a metal cable, the string itself is a fast flight material. So moving the cable from there to there, I'm going to get this wrong, so it's exactly the opposite of a string. So increasing the length on the string increases the draw length. Increasing the cable length here does exactly the opposite. So increasing the cable decreases the draw length. So this here, increasing the cable on the string Increasing the string increases the draw length. Increasing the cable decreases the draw length. So here, he's decreased the cable, so he's increased the draw length. That's kind of interesting. Um, so what else has changed? Now the shape on these limbs, you can see here, they went for a thicker limb here. So they increased the thickness there. The reason for that was this is the flexing point here. So they thought by increasing the thickness of the limb here increase the working area but what's particularly interesting for me is these edges here so I've said before on videos a lot of companies use very straight edges on their limbs and that then has a issue as far as it's a very definitive point so if you're a straight on an edge this point here is a weak point if they rounded the edges and made more surface area that gets rid of that weak point you'll see these limbs here are very much rounded so that reduces the chance of these limbs splitting. Now I'm going to actually look at this limb right there. And you can see the little marks on it. Hopefully they'll zoom up. You can see the marks where it's being dinged. And you can see there's no splinters splintering off. And the reason for that is because they've made such a large surface here, area here, making these limbs rounded. So that's pretty interesting. Um, plastic limb pockets, which is interesting. I think it's plastic. Maybe it's metal. Maybe it's metal. 
looks plastic, but it's actually metal there. So metal riser, and what's interesting here, back in the day, back in 1994, PSE used to make sights, and their sight used to fit in here, so it actually fitted into this sort of thing here, and the idea was it fitted in so it couldn't slide even if the screws came loose. Now they also had that concept here for the RRS, you can see that there, and with that then you can bolt on a lock-on um, overdraw or lock on one of the PSE rests. That was very standard with um, bow companies back in the 1990s. Um, you can see PSE, only one arrow um, sight hole. Today they have multiple sight positions. Stabilizer, um, today they use lots of bushings here to stop it being threaded out. The cable guard, this is um, to pull the cables away here. This is just a this was pretty standard back in the day. Um, today they're using more advanced um, carbon features. String was fast flight back then, which was prone to stretching. Today the materials are a lot stronger, 452X, so less stretching. See the position of the peep sight. So basically we used to get a lot of turning. Now what's interesting to me is the um, material here. This is monofilament, so it's like a fishing line. Back in the day when this used to break, it used to just unravel and go and then just basically rip off. Now back in the day, we used to use um, release aids, which used to go under the arrow. And you can see here, we always used to fit, a, um, this was called a neat eliminator button, still made, and the release aid would go under here. The arrow would go on here, and you can see he's tied on with some um, dental floss here. Now instead of using a knocking point, because you're drawing under the um, under the arrow, you used to then pinch the arrow. So you can see here he's applied um, a knocking point made out of dental floss so it doesn't press on the arrow and create contact with the arrow. So that's kind of interesting for me. So the physical weight of this bow, how does this bow vary to the modern bows 26 years later? The physical weight of this bow was 4.6, the new bows are 4.7, so almost the same weight. The cams are clearly different, um, but you know, very small cam. The limbs have changed, the limb designs have changed, the risers, risers now are longer, but actually not a lot heavier, which is kind of interesting for me. Um, you see the limbs, the cams are no longer in the center, so you can see the cam is off on one side here. Now you're going to say, well, how did the scores vary today versus back in 1996? And I'm going to say, well, the top arches are probably shooting similar scores today to what to back then. The difference is the less advanced arches are shooting scores similar to the top arches. So what it's done, the more modern bows and the modern equipment, has really pulled everyone's scores up. And yes, scores are better today. Arrows are better. Strings are better materials are better but the scores people used to shoot 300 for indoors back in 1996 they shoot 300 today but you'll see a lot more people shooting 300 than back then so basically everyone shoots a lot better today but the top shooters are still are still basically good um, so what we're going to look at today is how this bow draws what speed it shoots through the chronograph and how well I shoot with it and how much vibration there is and how, how this bow feels to shoot um, and how well I shoot with this bow at 80 meters compared to the modern compound. Um, now, let's hope I don't break it. He said if you can return it in one piece, that would be great. Um, so this is a 29 inch draw length. Um, you can see they used to hand write on the specs here, 50 to 60 pounds. Um, it's actually interesting because it's got 65 pound marked on the limbs. Um, I can't read the other dimensions here. I think this was to do with string and cable sizes on the bottom here. Um, but you can see the bow still looks in, and he obviously used this bow for a couple of years. Um, it looks in great condition for a bow which is 26 years old. Um, oh, PSE. So on the PSE bows today, you will see the little plastic washers which pull the limbs in. You can see they've still got these little washers here to keep these limbs in place. So some of the things that were around 26 years ago still exist today. So with that, let's shoot this. I'm going to fit a D-loop to it. Uh, going to fit a sight to it. Fit an RRS to this. Shoot it through a chronograph. 
um, see what the draw cycle's like. Um, and shoot at 18. Okay, so I've fitted a D loop to this bow. I fitted a whisker biscuit and a sight. Now, the first thing you notice is because this sight cut out here, you can't fit the sight square to the riser. That's because you had to fit a PSE sight to it or fit a plate to it to make it level. Or if this was a target sight, it just fitted straight in there. So, but if you're fitting a hunting sight, it didn't fit square. So, that was one of the problems with this design. Um, now, what you're going to notice also, what I noticed with this is modern compound bows they cut out the riser now square so you've got a big sight window back then they only cut out the arrow rest so when you look through this you can see half the sight you only get half the sight in in view now when you look through a modern bow you get the whole picture the whole aperture and you line up your peep sight with your housing or your scope down the other end with this bow as you can see basically half it's cut out doesn't really affect your accuracy it's just these are things that have changed um, now I'm expecting this bow to be not have a solid back wall you can see it's round at the back here mon bows are flat here so you pull it back and it just stops so it really helps the accuracy of the bow I don't expect this bow to be fast um, so this is a 60 pound bow 29 inches I'm shooting a 327 grain arrow so it's very light very very light there's a valley somewhere, and now I'm in, I'm in the back wall. I, I couldn't really feel the valley. Um, the valley's very short, and I couldn't really feel it. So I'm guessing it's like 60% let off. And back in the 1990s, 60, 50% let off was common. But it's, it feels comfortable to shoot. Uh, it's definitely not a draw cycle that you get in a modern compound bow today, which is you can feel you're building up more power with it. I'm going to guess a speed of 260 out of this bow, so let's just try and make the shot. Whoa. Wow, that's slow. That's the slowest bow I think I've ever shot. 234. Um, that was slow, wasn't it? Really slow. But the thing you'll notice, I don't know if you noticed it with my hand, the bow almost jumped out of my hand. Back in the old days, you had to wear a wrist sling because the bows jumped forward. The bow was quiet, you felt a bit of vibration through the cables. Jumping forward, you felt this. You can see, because it doesn't have a lot of compression on the limbs. This is quite, and you can, it's like guitar when you sort of play it. Um, I'll just have another shot. This doesn't affect the accuracy, it just affects the feel of the, of the bow. So very easy to draw. See it jump? Arrow shooting dead straight 232. So now I'll sight this bow in um, and shoot it. Now, back in the old days, back when this bow was made, PSE just used like little half moon limb pivots in here. So these limbs don't aren't drilled with um, aren't drilled to hold the limbs in place. So you can't pull these limbs out any further than this limb pocket. Some companies like Martin um, used to drill holes in the limbs and they used to use ball bearings or they used to use like a pivot to hold the limbs in place into the riser. That's not the case with PSE back in the 1990s. Um, so I'll sight this bow in. Um, I think I'll shoot okay with it because the draw length's about right. Um, even though it's slow, I still think I'll shoot okay, I think. We'll see. Okay, so I'm up here at 18. It's pretty windy. Now my sight settings, I actually shot about six arrows and I actually haven't hit the gold yet. So I'm just going to shoot this and let's hope I get a group. Um, now I'm going, I'm going to say that back when you remember shooting a bow in 1994 or 1980s, you'd think it was pretty good. It wasn't. It's not. The improvements in bows have been absolutely huge. Have a look at the vibration when I shoot this. Like, have a look how it jumps out my hand when I shoot it.
Now that's not saying you can't shoot this bow well. It's not saying that at all. What I'm saying is this bow is slower than the modern bows. There's more vibration than the modern bows when you shoot it. The draw cycle is absolutely softer than the modern bows, which is easier. So you're more accurate as far as the draw cycle because the modern bows have a physical stop. The modern bows are faster. Aiming wise, this aims fine. Like my sight pin just sits there because it's got a big brace height. You can see the position there to there, the limb position. It aims just as well as any normal bow. So you, this is why people can shoot decent scores with them. But you've got to practice. Um, with a modern bow, you can shoot pretty good without hours and hours of practice. I'm actually going to be quite interested to see what my group's are like. So back in 1990, what bows were big? Um, Dart was pretty big. Um, Martin was big in 1990s. They had um, D Wild shooting Martin. Miles, um, that was Martin was a big brand back in the 1990s. Um, Hoyt was around, but I don't think it was big like it is today. Uh, PSE was obviously around. Um, XI, I'm pretty sure had gone out of business by that stage. Um, York had gone out of business. And the bow I sold a lot of in the 1990s, the 1994s, was the Anida bows, the lever bows, because they had very little shock when you shot them. They were extremely popular. Um, now the price point on this bow back in the 1995s, 1994s, this bow, I'm going to guess, was probably Australian dollars wise, probably, and Andrew, the owner of this bow would know, but I'm going to guess we was probably around a thousand dollars for this bow, um, which is a similar price to modern bows today, 26 years later. Which I always always amazes me because in 1994, 1994 I brought a Toyota Celica, Celica brand new going through my midlife crisis when I'm 24 for um, $50,000 and a house down the road from me literally three three doors down sold for $45,000 um, that house today is worth $500,000 and that car's worth probably $2,000 so But being a boy, cars are important, right? So, Look, I actually don't mind the way this bow shoots. Um, I'm going to say it's pretty similar to all to the bows back in 1994. Um, I sold a lot of Dartons and Golden Eagle back in 1994. In fact, I shot my mum one or came second in the Australian Championships and she was shooting a Golden Eagle. Evolution I shot it the other day and I was amazed how bad it was as far as the shock and vibration compared to modern bows. But back then we thought it was pretty good. You'll see the balance in this bow. Um, now obviously this is a target bow so you'd fit target stabilizers to it, but let's shoot one more. Okay, so what's this bow worth today, you ask? Um, I looked on eBay and there was one for sale, exactly the same as this. Uh, exactly the same. 
blue, same limbs, same cans. Um, it was for sale for $150. And that was America. Just gonna find one more. So how would I rate this bow for $150 compared to the modern compound? I would go for the modern compound any day of the week at 150 Now that's American dollars, so equate that to Australian dollars. It means the person wants probably $250, $300 for it. So it's comparing this bow to a, to a modern Chinese bow. Um, Go down there and have a look. I think I've actually grouped the arrows because I heard two arrows hit, so we'll see. Okay, so okay, so I'm up here at the target. I can't get my fingers around the whole group. You can see basically I've scattered my arrows left, right, and up and down. Um, so how does that rate? Well, to me that's not as good as it's not as good as I shoot with the modern compound bows. So I did a review the other day on the latest PSE, the next 33, and I shot an incredible group at 18 meters. Um, but then I shot the 35 the day after and I didn't shoot that good. I'm gonna say the group on the next 35 was still better than this, um, but that's not a bad group. Um, I can almost kind of get my fingers around it, but they're not tight grouped. The tight grouping that I get with modern bows where it just locks into place, there's no vibration. I'm going to say the grip on the um, the grip on the PSE, well look at that gap in the middle there. The grip on the PSE is chunkier than they feel today. And even though the PSE with the new Next has fit it, have gone to rubber grip. This grip is clearly, it's a hard plastic. It's not as comfortable as the modern bows, but it's not bad. I'd probably shoot this bow without the grip and probably wrap a tennis grip around it if it's not comfortable without the plastic grip. So if I was looking to buy a target bow and I was on a tight budget, would I look at a bow like this or would I look at a cheap Chinese bow? And I'm going to say, look, any bow is good to get you started. Get yourself a decent set of arrows, the basic sight, basic arrows, basic release aid, and get shooting. You'll shoot okay with this. And then if you take, if you take a passion to the bow, um, as far as shooting all the time, then you can justify a more expensive bow. Um, so is this bow safe to shoot? Now with steel cables, you can't really tell if they're gonna go or not, but I'm gonna say my mum has an archery park and she has bows with steel cables and they're still shooting. So um, this bow shot particularly fine. The limbs, I mean, if they've lasted 20 years, they're probably gonna last another 20 years. Um, there is a bit of shock in it. You're gonna to prefer to shoot a modern bow like a PSC Stinger, but the PSC Stinger, let's say, is twice the price of a 26 year old bow. Um, but I'm going to say the old bows shoot okay and I'm going to say people shot pretty good scores with them so if you've got your if you can only afford a cheap bow then get started and get shooting and see if you like arrows flying towards a target that's not a bad group and the bow itself is solid strong and really nothing wrong with it and like I said, the modern bows are so much better. However, this gets you started and you can see if you like the sport. I'm Stephen Han from Archery Supplies. Thanks for watching. Bye.